Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. We are back to Social Security at the center of our politics. You know, it, it, um, Joe Biden, not accidentally, put it there, uh, or at least put the light on the fact that it was there during his State of the Union address, which is what now? Oh, it's more than a week. It's almost what? Almost two weeks. It's 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 been a while. It's the middle of it's the middle of February now. Um, he uh, put it there and and kind of got the whole center of gravity of the State of the Union ended up kind of being about Social Security because he got Republicans to argue with him about it during the speech. You know, so sort of our our, our first call and response. Uh, State of the Union address, at least the first one in 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 my memory, um, but it has it has kept up uh, since then, and that that has to be what the White House wanted, because anytime you're talking about Social Security and whether and how much Republicans want to cut Social Security or phase it out, or uh, tear it out by the roots, which is, I think, what Mike, uh, Senator Mike Lee said uh, the first time he ran for Senate about a decade ago. Uh, that's a good conversation for Democrats. Um, and so we have the Social Security policy discussion, but there's also a, a meta topic here, which is the national media's difficulty discussing this issue because you'll see a lot of um you'll see a lot of reporters talking about oh you know they're talking about social security uh that you know uh, the president and democrats are really beating beating uh republicans up over it you know kind of they have various words you know politicizing it uh you know all, all of these all of these ways of approaching it that it's kind of like a gotcha you know, that it's unfair at some level, uh, that, well, Rick Scott did this one dumb thing, and now he's, like, holding all Republicans responsible for it. Like, you know, politis, politics isn't fair, but, like, you know, he's not playing he's not playing fair and all this kind of stuff. But what you see, and uh, we, have, we have made this point a few times, uh, over the last uh, week in various things we've published. You have to be willfully blind not to know that Republicans have wanted to cut or phase out or privatize or get rid of some part or all of Social Security for decades, for decades. They were against it when it started, almost 90 years ago now. And there, you know, there was this, there was this kind of brief period, maybe in the 60s and 70s, when Republicans kind of made their peace with it. You know, that was one of the big things with uh, Dwight Eisenhower. One of the one of the things that Dwight Eisenhower did in the 1950s was basically make peace with a lot of the New Deal states. And there's actually a quote from him where he basically says, like, you know, there are some Republicans who want to get rid of Social Security, but they're idiots. He may actually, I think the word is actually idiots or they're dumb or morons or something like that. Um, but that came back starting in the 80s. And it's that this is a this is a through line going back uh, in, a, in, a, in a more focused way, 40 years. Uh, president Bush, the second President Bush, uh, tried to phase it out in 2005. And it's just constant. And actually, last year, the House Republicans, there's something called the uh, what is it, Republican Study Committee, I believe, which is basically, it, it's sort of like, uh, it's kind of like the Lo-Fi Freedom Caucus. It started as basically the conservative caucus in the House Republicans, uh, but at this point, there are no non-hardcore conservatives among House Republicans, so it's like three quarters of the of of the caucus, um, and there's some overlap with the uh, with the Freedom Caucus. They put out a budget late last year, a 2023 budget. So the budget that would be for this fiscal year that we are currently in, 
in which they proposed all the cuts available. They proposed raising the eligibility age. They proposed changing the formula that you have, you know, the annual cost of living adjustments. So basically holding down, preventing it from keeping up with costs. Uh, Raising Social Security for the very, very, very poor and cutting it for everybody else. And they also uh, proposed uh, making it so you could just take your Social Security money and invest it in the equivalent of a 401k. So basically, all of the House Republicans proposed doing this a few months ago for the current year we're in. So the idea that that some and there's like, you know, work requirements and stuff like that. I did. I did a post about it a couple days ago. I mean. There are. Two or three buckets of cuts that are that are generally in the mix when you talk about cutting Social Security. And they actually, they proposed all three buckets and actually a couple other buckets that I didn't even didn't even mention because they're so obscure. You know, it, it's like if you're if you're like in a music fan and they're and they're 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 whipping out these uh, CDs of some like kind of like you know obscure grunge band from Seattle in 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 you know the early '90s or something, right? They're so into it that the, that they're they're covering all the all the ground. So for the last week, you've had this dynamic where Republicans are on the one hand aghast and upset and and shocked that 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 Joe Biden is 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 accusing them of this thing this terrible thing and 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 uh you know I've actually seen some press reports in the, you know the the standard uh uh insider newsletters and stuff like Republicans are really want Joe Biden to stop saying they want to cut social security like like just a plea like why are you doing that stop hitting me Stop! Stop saying I—I I don't know some terrible thing. And at the same time, they're on the record; they do support it. And sometimes, even in the same statement, they'll say like, "Oh, you know, it's—it's it's terrible what Joe Biden's doing." Uh, well, of course, we want to cut this, that, and the other. And uh, the national press has never really, um, has never really found a way to. D- deal with this. I think in part, uh, in part because most reporters don't really understand the the policy the policy dynamics of Social Security. Most reporters just don't aren't very versed in 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 policy issues, and that and there's a lot of reasons for that. Not least of which is that you get into it to kind of dis- to discuss the sort of the back and forth, the kinetics of politics. Most reporters, the people you see on TV. Uh, the people who write on the front page of the newspaper, they're not they're not deep in, into policy issues. So that's where we are right now. The the uh, the Democrats are. Uh, keep pushing on it. Republicans uh, keep complaining and uh, the press kind of, you know, says, well, it's 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 maybe hurting Republicans, but I mean, it's not really. Can't really be true. I mean, maybe Rick Scott and one other random person or something, but it can't really be true. When, in fact, as I said, almost every Republican is on record this year, in this fiscal year, saying they support this. So we are going to, uh, we're going to get into that and a few other issues. Um, But uh, Kate Riga, what, what do you think? What do you make of all this? Yeah, so like you said, I think there are kind of multi layers going on here because we had kind of what you said, the speech and then the immediate proof of people very Republicans very recently talking about wanting to cut Social Security and Medicare. But then there's the overarching thing of like, this has been part of the party's DNA for decades. I mean, it's almost it shows you how kind of uh, warped and in their favor, the press um landscape is that they that this is at all any kind of an argument or a you know a story at all of republicans saying they don't want to do this it'd be as if democrats were like we've never wanted to raise taxes on the rich what are you talking about it's like that it's a a fundamental part of the party like of course they do it's not a surprise to anyone you don't even need to turn to 
the recent examples because that it's always been at the heart of this, you know. Um, but what I'm kind of interested in now is in 2011, when I was kind of doing research on a piece I wrote about this, what was really striking to me was the willingness of the Obama administration to look at various cuts, specifically to Social Security, because of Republicans kind of bullshit austerity framing. You know, the idea that the, the deficit is ballooning, we need to address it, we need to address it by, you know, what they would call cutting the entitlement programs. And, you know, just first of all, Social Security, like you were kind of describing, really is this kind of elegantly closed system in terms of Social Security literally cannot add to the deficit because if it runs out of funds, you know, if its trust fund runs out and the payroll taxes aren't enough, it by law, it would just have to cut benefits. It can't do discretionary spending or deficit spending. So, but even putting that aside, it is jarring, I think, how much in the last decade Democrats have become less willing to kind of play the game by the way that the Republicans and acquiescent reporters are framing it. But then, you know, they were, you know, the Obama administration, like we talked about before, was willing to kind of negotiate with the terrorists on the on the debt default and do it specifically by making these cuts to Social Security. And you had a post about this, Josh, that I read, um, which I think really does get at it, where there was there is some sense that the administration then was trying to do what they saw as good policy, right? And trying to kind of do this re this rhetorical work of, it's just, we're changing the way inflation's measured. It's not a cut. It's a cut, right? The, the conclusion of everyone was this will lead to lower paychecks in the future. Like that's how this will wash out, right? I mean, that's only, the only way you save money. Exactly. Is by paying out less. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so now I it does feel to me, and I'm curious to to hear if you agree that, some of those factors have changed a little bit in that we're seeing, I think, Democrats open up a little harder with um, the raising the tax angle as like, oh, you're so concerned about the solvency of Social Security. Here's the solution rather than kind of letting Republicans dictate the term so much. And then I think we're also seeing that with the, with the White House is just kind of like bloodthirstiness when it comes to this topic. Like they're talking about it every single day. You know, we're getting kind of like press bulletins full of and here's all the examples of republicans wanting to cut these programs like it really does feel to me like the aggression has kind of shifted to the democrat side about this it it it's funny with the it's it's a funny thing with with uh where the obama white house on this was and 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 we, we should make clear it's not like they were like this was their top policy priority or something like that um they were it wasn't, but it wasn't just. It was a combination of a series of things. You see, you see, it's it's the change between now and then, about a dozen years ago. Part of it is Democrats ap approach politics differently. We're basically we're not going to kind of sit down and 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 act like we're having a sort of a good faith negotiation here. A. Um, so part of it is that that the politics sh has changed. Like our politics is no. You want to do that? We're not going to say, "All right, we'll do fifty percent of that." We're going to say, "No, that's our that is our that is that is our stance." But the policy assumptions have also changed, um, and you see that at a lot of levels. I mean, one thing you know, um, uh, you know, Joe Biden had um, people like uh, former uh, Treasury Secretary Rubin in the mix, Larry Summers as, as a top advisor. Um, the, Summers especially gets, you know, gets a, a lot of grief today from Democrats for, for a lot of good reasons. But that is a different, that's a different place in terms of macroeconomic policy uh, than Democrats are now. And Democrats were very, were very bought into the idea that you have you do have to rein in entitlements. You've got to get you know you got to get the deficit down to down to zero. Just a different, a, a very different mindset. 
Um, and some of that, uh, you know, some of that is the politics of a different era. Um, what I think usually gets misleadingly talked about as, as you know, neoliberal economic policies, kind of a carryover from the Clinton era. I think it's a much more complex topic than, than it gets um it gets discussed as in our policy in our politics today but one thing and you alluded to this and i think this is something that's that's really captures it in a lot of ways there is this debate about um the cpi what is called chained cpi these are different ways you do an, an annual cost of living adjustment for social security now you might say why not just make it identical to inflation. That's the official inflation and and whatever. Okay. Well, it's not that simple because the economy grows. Right? I mean, in theory, you're you're you have you have people get r- richer over time. So, just holding it to inflation doesn't uh doesn't necessarily capture where you want to be in terms of providing a certain level of support. And the other thing is that what is required if you are in your late 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the amount of need you have is not identical to the, you know, kind of global in this in the, you know, the macro inflation rate. You don't buy everything. You buy certain kinds of things. You you uh, you know, certain things more than that. In any case, it's very complicated exactly how that should be measured. And there is a very technical uh, debate among economists in which some people say, we, we, you actually should uh, measure it in this other way. That's more accurate, right? And, and, maybe, it, and maybe it is. There, there's no, this isn't like... Um, this isn't like making sure you do your addition right. There's no absolute correct answer. There's all sorts of variables involved here. But I think what the Obama people did, and this does go to a different kind of technocratic way of thinking about politics, not only do I think they just kind of had the wrong position on this, but I think at some level, because of the kinds of people who stock the administration, they had this idea this is a kind of an in, this is an ingenious solution it's more accurate so it's not a cut we're not we're not cutting we're making it more accurate so like we can save money just by being more accurate right now <laughs> as we were saying like okay like maybe the current thing is inaccurate but it's what people get now and if you change it to something that is less that's a cut. So again, it, it kind of goes to a different, um, a different, a different mentality, a more uh, political, I think in a good sense, um, less technocratic way of thinking about these things, that this is not a, this is not a graduate seminar in macroeconomics where we're trying to kind of do some formula or something. It's, are people 30 years from now going to get $1 or 94 cents? You know, which do they need? Is it better to get a dollar or 94 cents? Well, clearly it's better to get a dollar if you're on the receiving end. So again, there's this, there's this technocratic aspect of it. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that, that at some level, they didn't know what they were doing. Of course they did. But you sort of convince yourself in a way. Um, but to your point, Kate, and it was interesting to me because, um, you know, I, I, I've been, uh, you know, following this for a long time. And, and we were talking about when you were, you know, reporting on this piece of, of seeing how things were pretty different a dozen years ago. And again, for for the Obama partisans, and I mean, I consider myself one of them, it's not like this was their big policy priority. I think they would say, look, we were trying to get into a real global negotiation about uh, you know, long-term debt reduction. So we had to put something on the table. 
we, you know, if they're going to raise taxes, going to do this, we have to propose something that kind of cuts against our interests. Um, and that's also true to an extent. I think they would also, some of them would say, look, we know they weren't negotiating in good faith. So it was sort of an easy thing to propose since we knew nothing was going to come of it. But again, there was, and I'll just, you know, one other thing. I was in, um, during the Obama years, I'm sure there's an equivalent of it now. I'm sure there was during the Trump years. Uh, you know, they, they call in groups of reporters every so often to talk with the president. Um, and uh, they do these things for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, it's part of their communications policy, What you know, whatever. They're off the record. And I went to a few of these uh, during the Obama years. And I remember I, I went to one of these. I think it was probably in maybe late in his first term. So it was around the time, it, it, was, it was around the time we're talking about, probably around 2011, something like that. And someone asked him one of these questions, like, kind of like, are you really, you know, do you really think we've got to kind of come back after the first two years of your administration in which you did X, Y, and Z, and we've got to start cutting? Like, I, I don't remember what the, I don't remember what the question was exactly, but the gist of it was sort of like, are you on the level with this? Like, do you really, do you really think this, or is this kind of, you know, stuff for public consumption or to show bipartisanship? And again, I don't remember Obama's verbatim response, but I remember how my reaction to it and it was pretty deflating because it was basically like, yeah, we need to do this. We need to get we need to get the budgetary picture lined up. And it was it was a it was um it was a very revealing moment to me because he did buy into a lot of this. It was a different time. And then it's interesting because we have in 2016 Trump sweeps in with a trifecta, right? The first Republican trifecta since George Bush in you know during the absolutely failed attempt to privatize social security in 2005 which was so utterly disastrous that it kind of like steered people away from making another kind of full-throated push for it for a long time. But you know, and that's the time when you kind of would think, okay, this stuff is really under threat, right? They actually have kind of the legislative might to do it themselves and to do it without having to negotiate with Democrats who are going to want them to raise taxes, right? And But it was interesting because I was kind of talking to people who have been in this, you know, doing this for a long time and who were in and around the White House during these times. And they were just saying, you know, the fixation with repealing Obamacare was kind of so overwhelming that Medicare and Social Security got pushed to the back burner. And, you know, not for the lack of uh, some stakeholders trying, you know, Paul Ryan was quoted as saying he was like badgering Trump about it all the time. And Trump just wasn't that interested. And then you also had Trump campaigning on not touching the two programs, which put him up set him apart from the rest of the field and I think is one of those like very weird Trumpy moments where he is politically astute about something and it, not that obviously Trump has some strong political instincts but he you know he's so um inconsistent and like lacks kind of any ideological conviction that he if he does have kind of a moment of political savvy he usually kind of flip flops off of it the next time it's convenient which he ultimately ended up doing with this too but that was kind of how we came in with this trifecta all the focus on the you know, they're going to punish obama they're going to repeal his big law obviously we know how that went and then they did kind of you know in in the trump's budget which you know the presidential budget is kind of just a messaging document for the president but he there was stuff in there like some you know cutting social security disability benefits and and various things like that but you know it it didn't end up ever kind of leading a crusade for republicans at that time 
which is all you know which is i think w- would be surprising if you just kind of looked at the you know the composition of congress and and uh republicans history of kind of caring about this an awful lot right well it's i, I think one thing as we all know is at the end of the day trump is focused on himself right how do i how do i gain uh, power how do i get more popularity how do i defend myself how do i make people love me how do i get how do i make money off this um and i think his political instincts there is you 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 just have to live in the country in the united states to say like is, is everybody going to be pumped if i say i'm going to cut social security checks and you just say like no like mm-hmm. like obviously not like that's just that's just obvious so you have to come at it with with either um either a strong ideological bent which which sort of professional republicans have or you have to be seeing it in this macro budgetary uh uh context in which you say we just have to we can't afford it anymore now i think the you know the the problem with that is i mean that gets into a very complicated argument about is the is the national debt too big is it is it are the deficits too big i mean i think generally speaking you can run deficits you can have a national debt there's stuff about you can you 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 want it to be stable it can't it it can't keep getting bigger indefinitely relative to the size of the economy overall in any case. Um, but again, you know, if it's social security, you can just raise taxes. It, it's, you know, you don't have to cut. Um, but, but with Trump and, and, you know, there's also the, um, as you say, Obamacare was the thing. Um, but not only did it, it's just, it's, it's so off, um, it's so off the radar for anything current Republican politics is really about. And, and Trump owns current Republican politics. You know, back in the, back in the Bush days, sort of, kind of, sort of, they had this idea of, of you know, a, an entrepreneurship society, an opportunity society. Don't focus on what the government can do for you. We're going to get out of your way and let you uh, strive and all this kind of good stuff. That's not what contemporary and and in that context, that's where you say, oh, you know, we're not just going to give you a government check. We're going to let you invest your money and 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 have your own entrepreneurship and cleverness and and you know, blah 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 blah. Let's not even get into the merits of that, but that's a that was the shtick. And now the shtick is we are going to punish the bad people in our society. And we're going to stop these immigrants coming in who are going to, you know, kill our, our children and women folk and stuff, and stuff like this. And obviously that's evolved now into, into stuff about gender and wokeness and stuff like this. But, 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 opportunity and you want to invest your own money that like what that's just not part of the song anymore so it, it's an interesting um it's it's an interesting kind of uh it it's it's interesting to think how this has come up again i think really it's come up again because again Professional Republicans, this has always been a thing for them. Even under Trump, it's still a thing for them. So when they're whip, whipping up their kind of like fake budgets and stuff like that, like that's always going to be in there. And um, you had, uh, you, as we know, as you and I discussed at the time, this came up in the summer where, you know, obviously this whole debt limit thing was, was you know, everybody saw this coming. And uh, some of the policy types are saying, well, we want to cut entitlements. We want to, you know, do, do this, that, and the other. But really, the, the driver here about this debt ceiling thing is more, we are going to stick it to the Democrats. We are going to 
you know, throttle this train and drive it off the tracks. And um, cutting Social Security and cola formulas and they they kind of they kind of backed their way into this and I, and they would do it but the white house and biden sort of saw like okay let's talk about that let's talk about what you want to cut which is you know kind of in some ways where these things always go but um the biden white house has different instincts than the Obama White House did, and the Clinton White House did, and, and here we are. Yeah, it's interesting because the one time it did start kind of bubbling up during the Trump administration was right after the Republicans had passed the massive Trump tax cuts of 2017. And all of a sudden, we're getting questions about, uh, you, Senator Deficit Hawk, have just ballooned the deficit with this tax cut for rich people. You know, what gives? And then back to the old standby of, Ah uh, yes, now we must cut benefits for poor people to compensate, uh, which is just so the the classic formula, right? Just joining these two things and like, you know, using that as you're so right though. It almost feels like antiquated at this point, you know, like Paul Ryan quaint young gun stuff that is just like a bygone era for the Republican Party now. And it, it's it's funny. I will say this that one of the things about Bush's attempt to do this, he kind of started signaling it right after he was reelected. Mm -hmm. So in late November and December of 2004 and, and you know, kind of kept moving in, into 2005, in some ways it was more similar than we kind of remember it because they were able to point that like somewhere in the GOP, in the 2004 GOP platform, it said something about social security, freedom, blah. But that had nothing to do with the campaign. That was not discussed at all. That, that campaign had two and a half things that it was about. The big thing was terrorism. And that was conjoined with the war in Iraq. We can say how that was part of how our politics was so screwed up at the time because those two things really had nothing to do with each other or shouldn't have had anything to do with each other, but politically they were conjoined. And then the other thing, gay marriage. That was the big thing. Uh, uh, religious freedom, uh, gay marriage. I mean, that was, there's a, there's a, there is a, there's a pretty strong argument that opposition to gay marriage won that election for George Bush because they got, you know, referenda, um, on the on the ballot and ran you know they pushed that into the into the um into the political dialogue don't don't bring these gay marriages don't be having two guys get married in my state stuff um so that was what that was about so it was national security fear culture war is really kind of what the you know, what what the campaign was about. Social Security didn't have anything to do with it. And that was one of the big reasons why he face planted so much. It was a weird kind of thing. People people asked him and asked his advisors, like, why why, why are you doing this? Like you, you didn't you didn't say you were gonna do this. You didn't campaign on this. This is kind of like out of the blue. Um and they had this thing like we have political capital now. <laughs> And and it's time to spend the political capital. In fact, I mean, they had barely won re-election. Um, no one was for this, and uh, you know, it 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 blew up in his face, basically. And and that the ongoing downhill catastrophe of the Iraq War and the occupation of Iraq. The social, the failure on social security, and then was sort of galvanized by Hurricane Katrina in, I guess it was late summer, I think. I can't remember if it was late summer, early fall of uh, 2005, kind of congealed those things together. And that's why by the end of, you know, by the end of Bush's second term, he was like down at like, you know, in the 30s. He was like, no one even wanted to talk about him. Right. Um, so it wasn't like he had any reason to think it was popular at the time. 
it was deeply unpopular. And he found out pretty quickly that it was. And now kind of the newest front on Republican attempts to fend off these attacks have been they've been going after Biden's own kind of checkered record on these programs saying, um, you know, he is the one who wants to cut the programs and blah, blah, blah. And there's um, I think it's in the intercept. A, a kind of long article about this showing how, um, you know, in his younger days as a senator, he was for for cuts or, you know, quote unquote reform um, and, you know, is not kind of unimpeachable on this thing, which I think, you know, partially it's we've talked as we discussed kind of at the top of the show. There has been a broader democratic evolution on these issues. And if there's one person who can kind of reliably be found in the you know as a, as a, in the mainstream of the party that's joe biden right so i don't think it's an utter shock and i do think it's like a, a little bit funny for them to kind of have to trot out like decades old statements to be like it's not us it's him you know yeah i mean he he's a median democrat he's always yeah. been a median democrat he'll be kind of where the center of the party is and you see that i mean this came up on other issues this came up on crime policy during the 20 you know in the primaries in the 2020 cycle Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he was you know he was where the party was at that time um and that just is what it is i mean like you know yes has he always had the same position on this like no he hasn't had you know just but like okay that was also 30 years ago and you know i mean what does that mean if the position is different now? And and I, w- I will say one thing. It's always important, you know, things get, um, one of the things that gets, that is sort of circulating around social media right now is a floor speech he gave in the Senate. I believe it was 1996, but maybe 95, 96, um, where he basically says, I'm willing to freeze everything. I'm willing to freeze defense. I'm willing to freeze Social Security. It goes through, you know, goes goes mm-hmm. through the whole thing, and that's what he said he was for. So that's what he was for. But it's always important to under, understand the context of any remark. He said that to make the point that he was willing to freeze even the things that Democrats most support, i.e., Social Security. So it's not that he's like crusading to do it. He's basically saying. I'm even willing to do this. And, but, you know, I, I'm not saying that is a, a non-position. It is, it is important to understand, and it's part of, the, part of the evolution that we were talking about before. Back in the 90s, serious people, serious Democrats, knew that you had to balance the budget and to balance the budget, you had to rein in entitlements. Not every Democrat, and that would sort of get uh, would sort of get set aside and all this kind of stuff. But there was definitely that mindset that was like, you know, really kind of regnant at the time. And and one of the one you you see you see it um you see it very clearly because in some ways as much as president obama was transformational in many ways on economic policy his administration was closer to the clinton era than it is to the biden era there's no question yeah and i mean i think it's I don't really feel the need to like go to bat for Joe Biden in this and be like, you know what? It was totally excusable. Like it, yeah. I would have had a different position. Yeah. I mean, right. it's just, I would it is have what always it is. been averse to the idea of cutting these programs. Right. Like, but the thing about it is I think it just shows what a weak position Republicans are in because for so long they have counted on primarily the press to kind of cover their tracks here and to buy their, kind of malarkey on um the the austerity stuff and the deficit and social security is going to go bankrupt tomorrow so we must do this you know and now that that is not being as reliable as a cover for them they're just like 
oh shit, we need to find something else, right? So they're like reaching back into the archives for potentially kind of damaging Biden statements. But the crux of it now is, you know, not only are none of these cuts going to happen because we Democrats control the Senate, and even if they got through the Senate, Biden wouldn't sign them. It's a political cudgel that the White House is using in a way that would, I think, have been almost foreign to the previous White House that Biden served in. And it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, that was 10 years ago and the evolution has been stark. And, you know, and one thing, you know, there was another one of these conversations. And again, this wasn't me and Obama, like having a couple beers or something. <laughs> this is this is a thing where usually it's maybe 10 journalists, the president, one of his top aides, and it's it's semi-structured, right? You know, but it's it's all off the record. And um, there was another one of these conversations where it 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 it, it, it was a funny thing because he he had this comment where he maybe it was 2013. We're kind of back to sort of like you know lo-fi debt ceiling hostage taking and another standoff and stuff like this. And he's talking about John Boehner, and he has this line. He says like you know. And and it's basically John Boehner versus I think this was maybe just before the Freedom Caucus was technically founded, but the Freedom Caucus existed, you know, under under different branding. And he had this thing about you know like I know John Boehner, like not John Boehner, but John Boehner, kind of you know Kiwanis Club Rotary Club Republican. He said I dealt with these guys in the in the uh, Illinois State Legislature. You know, like I know that guy. And he can't control uh, the crazies, right? But it was a funny thing where, to your point, um, Barack Obama, in some in some really basic ways, didn't like politics, right? He he, and and you know one of the one of the digs on him was that he was aloof, cerebral, all these things. Now, there's a lot going on in those comments, but he's not a, he was never a glad hander. You know, you see that thing after the State of the Union where like Biden it, it, it's it's like the guy who's going to close out the bar, right? He wants to talk to everybody. He loves it, right? And he, that's just him. He loves that thing. Uh the other part of that is that I don't think uh, Barack Obama then ever liked kind of like, we've got you on the ropes here, man. We're going to just kind of pummel you. We're going to beat the crap out of you on this thing. That's just, you know, kind of like we got to talk it through and stuff like that. And I think one of the thing, one of the, one of the things, if you, if you don't want to hear negative things about the Obama White House is that, Biden White House basically staffed with people who were from the Obama White House, you know, sort of in the same way that Clinton and Obama. These differences, it wasn't like people said, ah, oh, these Obama guys didn't understand away with them. A lot of these changes were the experience of the Obama White House, when a lot of these same people, and I think Joe Biden's one of them, saying, we got snookered here. We got played. We we you know, we were we were trying to have good faith negotiations with people who wanted to kill us. Um and so these 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 transformations are uh you know, born of that experience. And and you know, Joe Biden I think is kind of the the ultimate example. Man, I always, I always hear stuff um People saying, "Well, he's you know he's still so eager to compro compromise and and stuff like this." M maybe he is. I mean, he's still that guy who was in the Senate for like thirty five years or something like that. But I do think it was it was a formative experience for all of them. And um, you know, one of the big ones was getting negotiating against themselves on the relief efforts after the banking crisis mm -hmm. right and and 
extending the recession and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Right. Okay, let's switch gears a little bit here to talk about the newest entrant in the 2024 uh, Republican side, which is Nikki Haley threw her hat into the ring this week, Um, which is funny because we had discussed on a previous pod, we were just kind of, you know, batting around what we thought would be going on with timing of these people. And Nikki Haley falls squarely in the category of people who have nothing else to do right now. (laughs) So it's like, why not start now? It's a job. Right. Um, And it's, I don't know, it's interesting because the New York Times did this thing where they had all their columnists uh, kind of in dialogue with each other about, you know, do you, what do you make of kind of Nikki Haley's chances? And I mean, some of the Times columnists are like, you know, insane, but they were pretty much all on the same. I mean, some of the like, you know, Brett Stevens types were like, well, she would be wonderful. But, you know, the kind of consensus is all she can't. How could she possibly win? You know what? I don't think you need to be kind of a, a huge political mind to see at least right now. And I still think that DeSantis's star is going to dim when people get to know him better. But at least right now, it's kind of a situation where you've got Trump, you've got DeSantis, and then you've got the also rans kind of the rest of the field um and you know whether or not DeSantis kind of becomes subsumed into that field or not but that's kind of where it is now and you know you've got the the Nikki Haley's the Mike Pompeo's the Mike Pence's perhaps that are just like who is your constituency in this party you know perhaps that like sliver of you know Bush Reaganites who just is wistful for the party of yore and the genteelness and having these like patrician guys, you know, talk about pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and everything. But I mean, what percentage of that is that anymore? And you're already seeing her kind of dealing with this thing of she can't be angry at Trump, both because she so willingly flip flop back to being his biggest fan when he gained steam, but she also you can't stand there being like, well, he's the best. I'm just following in his footsteps because he's also running. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, some, some, there are some people who basically say, you know, she's a woman, she's a uh, South Asian. Um, even her religion is kind of ambiguous. I don't know where she is now, but uh, a decade ago, she, she basically said she was, you know, both Sikh and Christian. Mm. Um, and like, I don't judge, but like e- evangelical Christians don't accept that as a possibility, right? Um, I don't even think it's so much that. I think that um, in the Trump universe, they definitely have a place for non white men who, if you can own the libs hard enough, you're we're doing it right i mean there's whether they would make that person a president is another thing but it's just is 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 she going to be owning people like owning the libs and 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 what is she what is she for exactly there's just no logic to her um uh there's no th- there's there's no logic to her candidacy. I was I was going to say there's kind of n- no logic to her at all politically. She's kind of like Marco Rubio was mm-hmm. as as kind of like the next generation of not completely white people who are going to take us to the next level of opportunity and stuff. But that's not that's not what conservative politics are about in this in this country. But to your point, and this is what you know, I was working on a post about this um, before we started probably going to publish it sometime this afternoon. Her problem is really just a microcosm and a concentrated form of all of the candidates' problems because the race remains entirely about Donald Trump. It is about people who absolutely love Donald Trump. It's about people who did love Donald Trump but now would kind of like to have someone who is identical to Trump but not Trump, and uh, you know, and I could, I could, I could throw in a, ten other permutations, but that's really it. But you can see that the whole race, Trump is the sun, and they are all like planetoids 
you know, mm -hmm. orbiting around him, the entire, it's not just that he's like dominant, everyone else's campaign is about him, about how they could be him and not be him. And that's what DeSantis's thing is about. So, and that's why, even though there are all these reasons in my head that I think, all right, I just don't think he can do it again. There's all, you know, there, there's his declining popularity. There's that he might be in jail by all these mm -hmm. different kind of, I mean, all these different kind of things that at the end of the day, Donald Trump is the, the one who's going to win a race that is about who's the best Donald Trump. Right. And one of the, it's funny, one other thing I saw, there was, um, you know, you've had all these polls that talk about, uh, you know, his declining popularity among Republicans. And I think that, you know, during his presidency among, um, among Republicans, he's like, you know, he used to talk about it, you know, 95% among Republicans or even like, you know, I'm 97% among Trump supporters. Like, well, okay, dude, like I would hope so. Right. Um, now he's like in the seventies or, or 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 something like that, but when they when they looked a little um, when they looked a little deeper, what they found was that most of those people who have gone from Trump to non-Trump, they still like him, but they're convinced that other people don't like him, so they are just they still want Trump, but they're pretty sure that like their neighbor who was open to Trump is no longer open to Trump. So they don't want Trump because they 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 think he can't win again. And that is the kind of thing that that can move very quickly. And 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 that is why, you know, everybody says, well, they won't they won't attack Trump because, you know, they don't want to lose his, you know, the 30% of Republicans who support him. But I think it's not quite that. They all still support him. It's just that they think maybe he can't get it done again. So they're kind of looking for a, um, you know, a replacement Trump or kind of, you know, all these. And th that's kind of what Pompeo is doing and Nikki Haley's doing. It's certainly what, you know, what Ron DeSantis is doing. Um, they're all kind of doing the same thing. And, and uh, at least DeSantis is making a pretty good show of saying, I can be like Trump. I can, I can own the libs and I can, I can beat people up and I can, you know, do all these things and stuff. But Nikki Haley doesn't even have that. She's definitely not like Trump. Nothing like him at all. And obviously, you know, basically everyone who runs for president, I think, just has to have like a backbreakingly large ego in the first place. And these people also tend to be surrounded by, you know, yes men or people who are kind of like, you know, listen to me, you're a once in a generation political talent. Once people figure that out, you know, sky's the limit. And so I think that plays in. But the calculus here is so uncomplicated that it does make you wonder why is she running? Like, what is she trying to achieve here? I mean, I'm 100% sure on some level she has some kind of hope that Trump will collapse and DeSantis will collapse and she'll be what's kind of left in the rubble. Or if only she can make it through the primary, she has a good shot in the general or something like that. But, you know, is this a vice presidential angle you know trying to kind of get herself in the mix there is it one of those not sure what to do to keep my political career afloat so i'll run for president and keep myself in the conversation that way like what what do you think the kind of calculus is there i think it's a combination of those two things i mean yeah. the sort of what everybody's saying is she's running for vice president that's sort of uh, every non top tier candidate in every race is kind of running for vice president. And there's a certain, um, there's a certain bonus bonus with, uh, in, in this race, because if Trump is the nominee, I mean, she's not going to be, she's not going to be his vice president, but if she were, he can't run again. So it's not like you have to sit around for eight years, or it's not like you have to remember when you, when you, when you become a vice president, you're running in eight years at the soonest because 
you know, win or wh- whether you guys win uh, re-election or not, you're not going to run against your own president. So it's eight years off. This is like a bonus. You go, yeah, I'll wait four years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I think it's sort of like why, but you know, why not? Mm-hmm. What else is she doing? Um, and it's, I think with I think with um, arguably maybe some of the other potential candidates think like I'm I'm you know like DeSantis maybe I just wait let Trump do this one more time and come in after he's gone and but with her is she going to run for governor of South Carolina again is she going to be senator they have two senators so right. what else are you going to yep. do yep um and so the other thing we wanted to mention before we uh finish up here is that there is an election coming up this month that is enormously important and has really um i think kind of come under the radar in terms of this is a bizarrely timed off-year election um it is for an open seat on the wisconsin supreme court uh they have a conservative in her early 80s is not running again. This would be the first time liberals could take the court over since conservatives got it in 2008. Um, And it's just so staggeringly important to the trajectory of the state because the court will almost certainly at some point hear the abortion ban from 1849, which is in operation in the state now, which is bans abortion in basically every context and even the kind of life of the woman exemption is like it uses archaic language like quote therapeutic abortion which doctors don't even really know what that means um it's it's the situation we're seeing in a lot of states where it's you know you can intercede if she's going to die and then of course we hear doctors tell us you know it's not like a light comes on when that's going to happen so what do they have to let their patients get to death's door before they you know it's all it's all the same stuff we've been seeing everywhere else of course this law was passed before we had germ theory so definitely what we want to like govern how doctors act um so that'll come before the court at some point um if liberals take over the court the leading uh candidate in terms of fundraising anyway has already kind of promise that if she gets elected they're going to take up a challenge to the state maps the legislative and congressional maps um, which is huge because the gerrymandering in Wisconsin is so unbelievably egregious that in this perennial battleground state Republicans came within spitting distance of getting super majorities in both chambers of the state legislature this year and we've already seen them kind of strip the governorship of all of its power to make sure that a democrat can't kind of backstop them there um and then the other big thing is 2024 there are going to be election challenges i mean i think trump's kind of set the stage that there will never not be election challenges in any of the closely contested states and while wisconsin rejected his overtures in 2020 it was by a 4-3 margin. It was extremely narrow and only because one of the conservative justices sided with the liberals. So kind of enormous stakes here. And then the primary is going to be February 21. The top two vote getters go through and there are two conservatives and two liberals running. And then the general on April 4th. And then kind of on top of that, the Republicans in this aggressively gerrymandered state house are trying to make sure that their voters have you know a little extra incentive to show up to this weirdly timed election. So they're putting some kind of old school Republican fodder on the ballot as well. Like, should judges be allowed to take into account a person's criminal history when deciding their bail, you know, um, or an advisory question for the legislature, which is literally nothing. It has no force behind it. But the question that perhaps voters want the legislature to consider is, uh, you know, should we increase work penalties for low income people in the state trying to get welfare benefits? So kind of the the old school red meat there. Um, and, and that's a situation. Well, you know, it's 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 funny that, you know, it it. It is only a relatively new thing that at the national level we focus on state politics at all, totally. you know, on anything but like governor's races and stuff like that. And the idea that that 
were focused on a a state supreme court election that you know but by anything but the last few years that sounds so deeply obscure that you know half the people in the country don't even know that there are there are elections for 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 uh, supreme court justices and it 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 you know it obviously varies from state to state <clears throat> In a lot of states, I think, and you can tell me if Wisconsin is one of them, they have this kind of two-tiered thing. Like you can be appointed or elected, and it kind of depends if people, you know, when people leave and stuff like that. Um, but uh, you know, each of the each of the points you make is is very uh, central. But what I keep coming back to, Wisconsin is just the it is the poster child for um, you know non-democratic redistricting at the state level. Um, it, it is it is so obscene. You, you And it, you just look at the results. This is a state where you have a Republican senator and a Democratic senator. Um, it has been on a knife's edge for the governorship. Um, Scott Walker won a few times, I guess three times total. He won... He won the recall, and then he was reelected. Each time, tiny margin. Now Tony Evers has been elected twice by by very um, by very close margin. So it is a definitional swing state. It's right on a knife's edge, and yet, in the same years, when you have a Democratic senator elected, a Democratic governor elected, you have again the only thing that is ever up for question in that state is whether Republicans control the state legislature or control it with a supermajority. And that is just, you know, that is how you can measure the the sort of the democracy deficit in that state. It can it something is wrong if you have 50, basically 50-50 races for the statewide races, governor, senator, and you have overwhelming majorities for the Republicans every single time. It it's that is not democratic function in that state has broken down. So it is a huge deal. And it's, you know, it's also a huge deal that we're even talking about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because again, it, it, it sounds and used to be such a wildly obscure uh, thing, but it's, but it is a, a big, big deal. You have a piece on, on, on that race. I guess mm -hmm. you have another, you, you have two pieces you're working on. I think one piece today, is there another, there's another one coming or. Yeah. I, my first piece is just kind of the, the overview of what you have to know. Um, and then I'm working on a second cause I'm, I'm just really fascinated by the Republican use of, um, ballot initiatives here to kind of juice turnout, because I do think ballot initiatives in general, kind of until Democrats started trying with the abortion stuff was just, again, one of those tools where it just feels like Republicans are kind of light years ahead of Democrats in seeing, in recognizing the potential that they have to kind of uh, affect voter behavior and, and juice turnout and, you know, get uh, changes put into the state constitutions that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Well, is this a case where Democrats had any ability to go out and and do petition drives or this is just another another uh effect of the fact that the republicans controlled the legislature so they basically write you know write the terms of the election exactly yeah wisconsin is not a state where you can do um citizen uh or ballot initiatives that originate from citizens um right. so it's just legislature and when the republicans were like okay we're gonna put this this and this on the ballot because you know that'll perhaps help drive our voters out democrats were like okay well we want to put something on the ballot too like we want to ask voters if they think the state should repeal the 1849 abortion ban and republicans were summarily like mm, no we shall not have that on the ballot moving on so <laughs> well, it, it just it just shows that in a you know if you had a state let's say like new york state or california you are not going to get a self-perpetuating um, you know, gerrymandered minority party supermajority. It's just, it's too much. You can't, you can't sustain that. But in a state that is basically divided, you can sustain it because only 50% of the voters want it to change. And that's not enough to change it either through just elections or just the sort of the, the cumulative illegitimacy 
of the um, of the process. You know, I'll mention that uh, a guy named Ben Weekler, who uh, I have known for almost twenty years. I actually, when I met him, uh, he was the producer for Al Franken's radio show. So I knew him when he was like, you know, just like a kid, right? Like maybe younger than than you are now, Kate. Uh, he's now the um, the chair of the state party in Wisconsin. And he has really brought a lot of um, energy and smarts and just, you know, just, uh, um, you know, energy, a lot of oomph behind, you know, there's not some like, you know, kind of uh, uh, machine politician type who who's uh, running things there. And obviously it was a big disappointment um, for Democrats that Ron Johnson was reelected. Um, but Democrats did, obviously, Joe Biden won Wisconsin, and that, that was huge. And Tony Evers won Wisconsin. So uh, they didn't get everything they wanted, but they, they, they got a lot. And that's just, you know, I'll just kind of put out there that if, if obviously, if you're from Wisconsin and, and you're political, you're going to be thinking a lot about this. But this is a pretty important, uh, this is a very important race that, that Kate is, is describing for us. And they've got a lot of smart people. Uh, running stuff in that state. So if you want to, you know, get involved uh, supporting what they're doing, it's, it's, you know, they've, they've got, they've got sharp people on the The ground. One other thing I want to say about this before we wrap up is what I find kind of refreshing is that none of the candidates are really trying to mask their partisanship at all which is such a stark divergence from the what we're so accustomed to from the U.S. Supreme Court, this whole, you know what, I'm just interpreting the law, balls and strikes, folks. Now be right back. I got to go headline a gala at the Federalist Society, you know. Yeah. But in this race, it's just, and really um, the, the kind of Democrats led on this, and especially the leading one who I'm not, it's Janet something with a P and I'm going to get yelled at if I try to say her last name, but she kind of came out saying, you know what? The, the maps in Wisconsin are rigged. Um, she said that at a candidate forum. She said they're unfair. They don't represent the people, which is like shocking from a judge, but patently obvious. Right. And then she has an ad out doing kind of a direct to camera uh, abortion should be between, you know, a woman and her doctor. Um, Everett Mitchell, the other Democrat, has been kind of similarly outspoken. Um, Dan Kelly is one of the Republicans who was a state Supreme Court justice. And and readers might remember he lost his seat to uh, Jill Karofsky, I think is how you say her name, in 2020. That one was like kind of on the radar in a way that it hadn't been before as well. That kind of set the um, spending record for uh, state for state court races. And so he got ousted. Now he's back trying to uh, get back on. And in the meantime, you know, he's gone on a Republican election integrity tour. And he talks about how Democrats like abortion because it allows them to be sexual libertines. And uh, his favorite opinion ever written is a, uh, um, Scalia's descent from Obergefell, right? So he, that's one of the conservatives. And the other one actually came to prominence because she was in charge of the trial for the guy who plowed into people on the sidewalk with his car, like in at the Christmas market. Oh, right, kind of right, right, right. The first high profile one of those, which people seem to be kind of doing all the time now. Um, right. That was her claim to fame. She has said, uh, when asked to describe in 2016, a particularly bad uh, judicial opinion. She named uh, Lawrence v. Texas, which you know banned anti-sodomy laws and kind of laid the groundwork for Obergefell. Her husband was a uh, uh, in Trump's Department of Homeland Security. So it's just it is a case where I think it might not matter because who knows how much people are paying attention. I mean, it's going to be like pulling teeth to get people to vote in this election. But right. the cards are out on the table in a way that for especially you know, judge appointments or elections are usually covered with this just aggravating facade of like, I'm a neutral person and politics don't affect me. At least in this one, you know where everyone stands. <laughs> well, you know, we have to wrap up, but tell me this. I'm curious because h how did that, like, I understand how like the judge in something like uh, the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, case since mm -hmm. 
that allows a judge to to arguably, you know, kind of flaunt their decision making on a very, uh, um, you know, polarizing issue. But there's no there's no constituency for like plowing your car through like a bunch of like helpless parade goers. So what how, how did that how did she be? Was it just that she was on TV a lot and kind of people liked her and her 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 stature raised, or did she did she conduct that trial in a way that sort of made her a, a darling of the right? I think it was that um... maybe more the form, the latter, that kind of just name recognition. No, it's a really, yeah. it's an interesting point. Yeah, it definitely really uh, boosted her profile and then I think it had the additional thing where she was like really tough on him and gave him like the biggest possible sentence and you know with a a crime like that where kind of everyone is uniformly pretty horrified I think it's you know she's a she's a you know she's bringing down the hand of the law so it kind of I think did both big raised her profile and then did it in a way where she can spin as like I am no nonsense so that's where we are. So February 21st, that's the primary top two vote getters go to the general on April 4th and um, which, you know, will decide the ideological balance of the court. Got it. Well, let me remind you, uh, tell you one last thing we are doing. You know, we're, we mentioned, uh, you know, the first half of the show, we talked about uh, Social Security politics and we are collecting examples of Republican politicians who in, you know, in recent history, in the last decade or so, or, you know, kind of whenever, when were they, when did they make a statement saying, yeah, I want to cut Social Security? Uh, Yeah, I want to, you know, raise the retirement age or all the different kind of like, you know, kind of uh, uh, bamboozling wordplay. But we're looking for examples because pretty much all of them have said it and they're all now uh, denying it. So this is an example. If you, you know, you're going to be familiar with people from your own state, your own district, your own region or something like that. If you have examples, send us the example. You know, a a lot of our editorial process is getting tips from readers. So if you have an example, uh, send it to us. The email is talk at talkingpointsmemo.com. Really simple email. Uh, You know, one of the things, if you haven't been a, if you're not a a, a longtime reader of TPM, we really read those emails. They come to every one of this, you know, back in the old days, they only came to me when, when, when I, you know, it was just uh, 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 my site, but we read all of those, you know, a lot of site, you, you, you send a comment and you're like, okay, what is that? uh, You know, where does that, where does that go? Do any of these uh, things get read? These get read. So send it again talk at talkingpointsmemo.com and have the subject line GOP social security cutters. So we'll be able to kind of, you know, pick those out and, and add to our list. Um, I think that is about it. Uh, let me remind you the, uh, Josh Marshall podcast brought to you by Grady's cold brew ice coffee. You can get 25% off by using the promo code TPM and you can buy Grady's at your, you know, your supermarket or your grocery delivery service, but you can also go online to Grady's cold brew.com. And again, 25% off with the promo code TPM. And I think that's it for this week. That all, all we right. got. See you, See you next week. All right. Week. Later. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Jansfeld for our podcast theme song, and thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe wherever you listen.